Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin, and this is Life, Liberty, and Levin Sunday. Two great guests, Jim Trusty, former DOJ prosecutor, former President Trump lawyer, and our buddy Pete Hegseth. He has a fantastic new book, The War on Warriors. So relevant, so important on our national security, and the men and women that give it all for our country. But before we get to them, I've been doing a lot of thinking, as most of you have, about what took place in that courtroom last week. And its implications beyond getting into the weeds of grand juries, and jury instructions, and collateral evidence, and so forth and so on. Because it's so much bigger, so much bigger than the rules of evidence and so forth. What am I talking about? The Democrat Party. The Democrat Party's cheering what took place. Their surrogates are cheering what took place. Joe Biden went to a microphone and lied about what took place and then sneered at it. This is part and parcel of their war on the Constitution almost from day one. Almost from day one. This is the party that supported nullification and slavery. This is the party that supported uh, separate but equal, that is segregation. This is the party that supported Jim Crow. This is the party that supports and embraces American Marxism, which rejects the Constitution and the founders and the framers. They use the 14th Amendment in order to try and prevent Donald Trump from running for president. And this is what they do. And that's what happened in New York. Let me put it to you bluntly. South Carolina was the point in which the Constitution came under attack, came to a head. It resulted in the Civil War. New York is the new South Carolina. That is the Confederacy. What do I mean by that? I'm not arguing here that there will be a violent civil war. I don't know what comes. Nobody does. What I'm arguing here is the Civil War was about slavery and about the attack on the Constitution and the attack on the Union, the nation. What took place in that courtroom? The jury should never have been impaneled. A Soros prosecutor and a Biden judge, in effect, decided that they were going to launch a war against our constitutional construct. How so? By nullifying the due process clause of the Constitution in the Fifth Amendment, by nullifying the due process clause that applies to the states through one of the post-Civil War amendments, the 14th Amendment. And if this stands, the consequences will be very dire for the future of this country and the Constitution. Let me put it to you this way. The new process goes back to the Magna Carta, 1215. But the phrase itself appears in a statute that was passed in Britain to incorporate the Magna Carta in 1354. And uh, that was during the reign of King Edward III. And so we have this process where we have the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment. And what do they say? With respect to due process and equal protection, they say exactly the same thing. In essence, no one shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The 14th Amendment was adopted by Congress in 1866. Before it was an amendment, they proposed it to the states, which then ratified it in 1868. The Fifth Amendment was added to the Constitution as part of the Bill of Rights in 1791. So this is ingrained now in our country, ingrained in our country. And what took place in the Manahad courtroom was the first massive assault, massive assault on the Union, due process, on equal protection since the Civil War. So there have been individual cases, but the impact of this, the presidential candidate, your former president, the purpose of which is to influence a national election, we've never seen anything like this, anything like this, and it has now been resuscitated uh, after we fought the Civil War put the whole idea of nullification for bed. Now, let me go further on this. Our friends at the National Constitution Center, nullification is the constitutional theory that individual states can invalidate federal laws or judicial decisions they deem unconstitutional. And it has been controversial since its assumption in American history because the Constitution doesn't provide for nullification per se. Now that said, this is even worse than nullification than we've seen in the past, nullifying federal laws. This is a nullification of two amendments to the federal Constitution. 
a nullification of amendments to the federal constitution that basically enshrine the entire belief system in the Declaration of Independence, your right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. James Madison is considered Mr. Constitution. This issue of nullification was raised with him by a former senator, Edward Everett, and James Madison wrote a very long letter back to him on August 28, 1830, and he said this in part, being thus derived from the same source as the constitutions of the states, it has within each state this idea of nullification, the same authority as the constitution of the state, and is as much a constitution in the strict sense of the term within the prescribed sphere as the constitutions of the states are within their respective sphere. But with the obvious and essential difference that being a compact among the states, that is the constitution, in their highest sovereign capacity, the states adopted the amendments, excuse me, the constitution, and constituting the people thereof, one people for certain purposes, that is, you're a citizen of a state, but you're also a citizen of the United States under the federal constitution. It cannot be altered or annulled at the will of the states individually, as the constitution of a state may be at its individual will. In other words, a state constitution or state legislature cannot nullify the nature of national citizenship that was adopted by states. By states. These amendments later we'll get into. It's worse in this case in Manhattan because the state as an entity is an act. It's a piece of the state, a small piece of the state, one judge and one prosecutor. So it's worse. He says between these different constitutional governments, the one operating in all the states, the others operating separately in each, with the aggregate powers of government divided between them, it could not escape attention that controversies would arise concerning the boundaries of the jurisdictions, and that some provision ought to be made for such occurrences. A political system that does not provide for a peaceful and authoritative termination of current controversies would not be more than the shadow of a government. The object and end of a real government being the substitution of law and order for uncertainty and confusion and violence, which of course is exactly what Bragg and Mershon have done, have done in their courtroom. Not the state legislature, not the governor, two people, two people. He goes on, quote, that the Constitution and the laws made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land, too, that the judges of every state shall be bound thereby by anything in the Constitution and laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. Three, that the judicial power of the United States shall extend to all cases of law and equity arising under the Constitution, the laws of the United States, and treaties made under the authority thereof. Well, the issues that took place in that courtroom arise under the federal constitution, which is why Joe Biden, an old confederate who supported racism and segregation, opposed Brown versus Board of Education by opposing the integration of our public school systems. That's why he got up and said, this is a state court issue. No, it happened in a state court. That doesn't make it a state court issue. Madison goes on. He says, with respect to the judicial power of the United States and the authority of the Supreme Court in relation to the boundary of jurisdiction between the federal and state governments, I may be permitted to refer to the 39th number of the Federalist for the light in which the subject was regarded by its writer, meaning him, he wrote it, at the period when the Constitution was dependent. And it is believed that the same was the prevailing view then taken of it that the same view has continued to prevail, and that it does so at this time, notwithstanding the imminent exceptions to it. He said, there is no nullification right under the Constitution. Period. And what I'm saying is what took place in that Manhattan courtroom was the nullification of a part of the Bill of Rights of the 14th Amendment, one of the Civil War Amendments. Finally, he says in part, what the fate of the Constitution of the United States would be if a small proportion of the states could expunge parts of it, particularly valued by a large majority, and have but one answer. And he meant by that a civil war. 
That's 1830. He could see it coming. In 1834, he wrote a long treatise on this, December, about nullification. And I'm not going to read it to you in full, but I'll read one section. It follows from no view of the subject that a nullification of a law of the U.S. can, as is now contended, belong rightfully to a single state as one of the parties to the Constitution. The state not ceasing to avow its adherence to the Constitution, a plainer contradiction in terms or a more fatal inlet of anarchy cannot be imagined. He said that New York is part of the United States of America. It's signed on to the Constitution. It can't now say, okay, but as far as the due process rights go in modern time, we're going to allow Mr. Bragg, Mr. Mershon to have their way. They basically eviscerated 